Well, I'm delighted to um, see so many faces in the call and to welcome you all to our event this morning. Um, and in particular to welcome um, Wei Yang, our RTPI president for the year. So welcome Wei. And uh, as we've just been saying, it's a bit grey here in Cambridge, but uh, nice to have people from across the east of England joining us um, and also with the southeast as well. Uh, it's nice to do a joint event uh, and a joint presidential visit. Um, so today's event is celebrating UN International Family Day and exploring the importance of planning for families. And we're going to be doing that through two uh, case studies. Uh, this morning we're looking at Letchworth Garden City. As many will know, uh, it's the world's first garden city and obviously um, something that Wei uh, knows lots about. And we're excited to hear from her um, uh, in terms of uh, implementing kind of 21st century garden cities approach. Um, and we've got two speakers joining us, uh, David Ames and Stuart Sapsford from Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation, who will be giving us an understanding um, about uh, the current circumstances in Letchworth and how it's responded to the pandemic uh, and using land value capture to support families. Our second presentation will be looking at Milton Keynes, and I'm very pleased we're joined by um, Heather Pugh, partner at David Locke Associations who is actively engaged with the TCPA in providing best practice evidence for new garden city communities. And she's going to be giving us a snapshot tour of Milton Keynes as a planned settlement and how it contributes to family life. And I'm very pleased uh, that this morning we have um, lots of young planners with us today. So I'm very pleased that we've got um, uh, Beth Jones, from uh, the, our Young Planners Chair in the East of England and uh, Alexia Kalini as well from the East of England. And we're also joined by um, Graeme Wilson, who's the co-chair of the Kent Young Planners and Susie Green, a member of the Thames Valley Young Planners Network. And they're going to be uh, leading some uh, questions to our presenters and um, hopefully pulling out some interesting aspects of the presentations. And then Graham Wilson will be leading a panel discussion looking at the delivery of um, families in the future, planning for families in the future. And we're really looking forward then to Wei giving us some reflections um, uh, on the presentations. And um, as I said, some insights into how this feeds into planning for the future, um, and especially drawing on some of the ideas from Wei's manifesto for the year. So I'm going to just cover a bit of housekeeping. Um, if our could, delegates could please keep their microphones um, on mute. Um, but as I said, we will have a, a long uh, question and answer session. So please do put some questions in the chat uh, or raise your hand and um, Graham will come to you um, to ask those questions through the panel discussion. And we are recording this morning's presentation. Um, so uh, if you do drop out for any reason, if any, if you lose connection at all, uh, then please just try to rejoin uh, via the link. But if for any reason uh, you're unable to do that, um, then the presentations will be available on the YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll be able to rewatch at any time. So without further ado, I will hand over to our presenters um, for Letchworth Garden City and uh, David Ames and Stuart Sapsford from the Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation. David is our uh, Senior Vice Chair for the East of England region and also Executive Director for uh, Stewardship and Development for Letchworth Garden City Heritage Foundation that owns the freehold of the Letchworth Estate. And uh, David has been a chartered member of the Institute for 25 years, working in both the private and public sectors and is now responsible for the management scheme in Letchworth as well as the planning and development of the estate, including the first expansion of Letchworth since the 1980s. And Stuart Sapsford um, is the Executive Director for Communities, Culture and Heritage, and he looks after many of the Foundation's services across the town. And Stuart joined the Foundation from previous roles um, as the Director of Community Services for the YMCA, where he worked for six years to improve services for local residents and he has um, previously worked for Hertfordshire County Council and Youth Connections, so has extensive uh, experience in creating and delivering a wide variety of projects and services for young uh, people. So over to you, uh, David and Stuart. 
Lovely. Thank you so much, Charlotte. And uh, good morning to everyone. And, and uh, welcome to Letchworth Way. I know that uh, you're, you're familiar with us um, from, from your sort of various uh, visits and, uh, and discussions around garden cities. So um, what we would normally be doing on an occasion like this is that we would be walking around Letchworth and uh, look at, looking at some of the, the, the key buildings and, and street scenes and so forth. Although it is a very miserable day today, so perhaps it's not not too bad. But what I've done is whilst I'm, I'm speaking uh, just for a few minutes, I've um, put together a little virtual tour so you can see some of the things that we might have looked at uh, as we we're walking around and hopefully you can see sort of like the, the beautiful sort of street scenes and buildings where that careful master plan uh, really has um, endured. And, and Letchworth continues to evolve. It, it has 35,000 people living there, 15,000 people working in Letchworth, and uh, it continues to meet uh, modern needs. So the Heritage Foundation, for those of you who don't know us, we are Community Benefit Society, and we're successors to First Garden City Limited. So Ebenezer Howard's company that um, was funded by philanthropic limited dividend uh, private investment. But that was set up to create a living experiment of his Garden City principles. And really that, that was done to show what can be achieved with the thought that government would then take this on, creating a city based approach to regional planning uh, with a, a central conurbation at its centre, a series of uh, garden cities that are interconnected uh, around them. And, uh, and then uh, enabling inner city regeneration uh, with people decanting out, out of those urban areas. There's much talk about garden city principles. We, we hear an awful lot about it, but sadly, there is still a, a mis misunderstanding about what it, it entails in its entirety. So it's not about a particular design. We can see these, these beautiful designs uh, that we have in Letchworth. But to create a garden city isn't necessarily about rough cast render with chimneys and uh, clay roof tiles. It's about uh, creating great places where people want to live for everybody. It was a home for workers, Letchworth, and a place for people to work, to live, for community, for leisure, for access to countryside and open space. Beautiful homes for everybody across all tenures. But at the heart of the Garden City is a social, community and economic model. And this is the bit which is sometimes forgotten. Land value capture, community governance and long term stewardship are absolutely key in our Garden City principles. What drove Howard was this principle of the unearned increment. The fact that development and rental incomes substantially increase, but the community gains no benefit from that. And that's one of the things which really drove him to putting forward these Garden City principles and the elements which are sometimes lost. Letchworth Garden City is the only garden city at scale in this country that applies these principles. This is by way of the foundation, reta retaining the freeholds as successors to First Garden City Limited. And we're governed by an act of parliament as owners of the Garden City estate. And what that means is that we reinvest surplus from the estate for community benefit. So in practice, this means that we receive around 12 million pounds a year from mainly property portfolio, but also from our venues. This generates a surplus of around seven to 7.5 million pounds a year. And that's reinvested through a series of charitable commitments set out in statute. So we're not providing uh, statutory services, but we do support some of them, but we provide additionality. And that's through community support, arts and culture, providing venues, the green wage, providing access to the countryside. There's no point in having the best of town and country if you can't get access to the countryside. A management scheme providing an additional tier of control to ensure that those street scenes are protected. Museums, community programmes, all of these things are so very important, but this is funded by sources which in most other towns that, that would be leaking out through private ownership. And it's also determined by a community governance structure. So that means that local people through no political allegiances are able to set our strategies and Stuart and I and our other, other directors then implement that, those strategies nominated by local groups, elected by the local community. These people are able to shape 
to see what uh, we should be doing and how we do it. And overall, this enables the community to have a real say, but for us to provide those additional services. And COVID has really highlighted the importance of providing those. So as, as we are um, celebrating uh, international families and the importance of those, Stuart's going to say a little bit more about what we're doing with respect to supporting families and how that land value capture in operation can act in an agile and flexible way in order to provide that additionality that we think is a benefit to the local community. So I hope that's a, a useful quick uh, snapshot of Letchworth. But what I would say is that anybody listening and, and particularly you, Wei, you're very welcome to come and see us. We love to show people around. We love to say a little bit more about our governance and our stewardship, which is what does differentiate us from other places. And uh, we're always keen to have visitors, be it your clients, local authorities or, or other groups. But I will now um, hand over to Stuart. Thank you, David. I'll just call up my slide. So as David uh, has, has mentioned, we capture uh, the value of the town um, and I have the um, most luxurious position, I guess, of being able to work out how to reinvest that in the community. And um, I feel it quite a privilege, although at times quite a pressure to make sure that we reinvest in the right way. So uh, today's focus is obviously on local families and making sure uh, that we share a story here of how we reinvest uh, in our local families. Um, and as David said, we've got a range of services that we deliver locally, and, and I try to frame these in three very clear categories. First is our commercial venues. So we have a cinema, theatre, educational farm, to name a few. Uh, and within these, we try to deliver leisure and health and well-being activities and services to our residents, but also people from outside of town. Um, at rates that are affordable and looking at how we can uh, introduce opportunities to deliver to some of our more vulnerable families and individuals in the town. We have an arts, culture and heritage offer. David's talked a bit about the heritage of the town. We've got a very uh, thriving arts and cultural scene and, and have always had so. And at the moment, we're trying to look here at how we can create a cultural strategy within the town with our partners to try and develop activity for some key target audiences, including our families. But the bit I'm going to focus on uh, today are our community services. So historically, we have had a range of community services, a grant programme, reinvesting money into the town to the tune of just over £500,000. But before diving into that, some, um, some some headline here really to say that what we're doing as an organisation is trying to be more evidence based and data focused. So understanding our community, consulting with the community, using evidence and need as the primary drivers for delivery of services. As a result, for all of these services, we've created a range of audience development plans. And within these, we've tried to articulate those audiences we're focusing on that should be beneficiaries of our services. And obviously families is a real key one here. So just diving a bit deeper then into the data, uh, David's shown some, some really nice slides of the town. I'm now going to show some slides that maybe paint a slightly different picture of the town because actually is nice and leafy and green and, and from some outsider's perspective is often perceived to be uh, wealthy and of high class and, and, and doing fine. Well, actually, the reality is that taking the index of multiple deprivation here, we do have some pockets of significant deprivation. You'll see the red and the dark red uh, brown uh, colours there that signify the higher end of the deprivation. And we've got one particular corridor on the and the south uh, east corner, which we know as the Jackman's estate, which has drawn some particular attention from us internally um, and, and has been the route to, to one of our programmes that I'll talk to you about in just a short while. So just picking out three key headline statistics really here, what the data and the evidence is telling us. So we know that there are some pretty significant <coughs> figures, some that I'll show you on the next slide, uh, around families, income, poverty, child development. And through our work, we've learned and recognised that the first three to five years of a child's life is extremely significant in determining its future 
uh, opportunities, future achievements. Um, and many studies are now demonstrating that by five, you can map out many children's lives and their achievements through their lives by their skills development, by their family support and some other internal and external factors on them. So it's quite a, a, a kind of an alarming uh, statistic for us to look at when we move through to the next slide. So low income as well, building through to the second point here, 34 percent of social housing in Letchworth compared to our national average of 18 uh, and a local average of 14. So an extremely high level of social housing here. And many of you will be aware of uh, the income related statistics that uh, we can draw there. And really, as I said at the start, when we compare Letchworth to other towns, <clears throat> particularly towns close to us, but across the country and the perception that Letchworth has, it's quite surprising and alarming to see that we've got significant areas of deprivation, low income and children entering schools with levels of development that are far lower than what they should be achieving. And that links us through to the next slide. So you'll see there quite a strong statistic on the left hand side. 53% of children at age five when they start school are developing well. But compare that with the national average, North Hertfordshire average and Hertfordshire average, you'll see that there's quite a gap in the data and obviously some areas of focus. Now, thinking back to the slide uh, of the index of multiple deprivation uh, and understanding uh, the, the Jackmans in particular, that one area that we're focusing on, these two slides, these two graphs really start to bring some of that to life. So you'll see the statistics for those that are children in out of work households and those within an impoverished household as well are significantly higher. So that really is the driver for us behind uh, the ACORNS project, which is the first project on this list here, but also the re-evaluation and the restructuring of our strategic plan to be really families focused, to start thinking about our partners within the town, to take an evidential base, to make sure that we're building relationships and understanding what others are doing and create an infrastructure, not only in that community, but the wider Letchworth town community. So our focus now through our strategic plan are these five key areas, the ACORNS project, which is very neighbourhood focused, a financial inclusion programme, which is a town wide programme working with some key partners. And here we're trying to understand the impact of the pandemic and how we can support families who have been most impacted, but also a new category of persona for us, which are the just about managing those families that have just about just enough financial income to be able to to pay their bills, to put food on the table, that with a slight effect to their income would move through to that poverty situation and become one of those statistics that we see. So we're now starting to think about how we put programmes in place to support these to not fall into the poverty trap. And then the final three I'll touch on a bit later. So continuing a grants program, looking at commissioning and thinking about social action, how we can engage a community to make sure it's not just the few partners that we have available to support, but the whole community getting behind that support for uh, those in need, particularly those families in need. Oh, sorry about this, really busy slide, but really important slide. This is the framing of the ACORNS project. So working with our local partners, uh, which was a really important starting point, understanding the local schools, the family centre, some of the activities that took place there, pulling them around a table and trying to work out where we wanted to go, how we would achieve this change for families and how we would embed it in the community. And I think that's the really important bit to pause on before going, any, uh, going into any of this detail is what we're trying to achieve here is not a parachute project where we go in and we solve problems and we disappear again, but trying to create infrastructure, trying to develop skills, trying to give opportunities, trying to create community partners that can support themselves as well as others to ensure there's long term gain and long term sustainability of, of what effectively we leave for them. So now looking in some, some of the detail here, we start on the right hand side. So we firstly consider, for those of you that are not familiar with the theory of change, we firstly consider the outcomes and what we're trying to achieve as part of this partnership and work. So locally, with working with our key partners, we've determined a series of outcomes that we'd like to achieve for those families that live in this area. So we want parents to be confident and resilient. 
We want them to support their children in learning outside of school. We want them to take part in activities and to deliver activities themselves. But crucially, what we want is children to be school ready. We want them to reach the age of five and be in a position where they're achieving the appropriate skills development levels to give them the best opportunity and start in life. And we want to make sure that local partnerships, local support is embedded and becomes part of day to day life and supports not just the generation that's coming through now, but future generations within the town. So again, working backwards, looking at the intermediate outcomes and the activities, some of which we're starting to do now, much of which is around immediate skills development, putting tools in place for parents to be able to support their children and uh, within their households to develop. So the activities we're starting to put in place, some real strong community activities, some of which have taken place throughout Easter and some which will continue through to the summer, um, some health and wellbeing related, arts and crafts related. So we'll link in with the other teams that uh, within the, the directorate, within the organisation, as well as our community partners to come to the uh, to the area and deliver some of these uh, activities for the families there. But the really important thing uh, that we've been able to create here is the strong partnership. We understand the resources that uh, these organisations can put in place. We've got a really strong school with some strong leadership, a really strong families team that are working with those those families to engage them. And crucially, so far, we've you know, exceeded anything we expected. We started the programme a couple of years ago, putting the partnership together. Uh, since that, we've been able to deliver some activities. Obviously, the pandemic slightly changed this, but actually brought to the fore some of the uh, some of the needs and issues and brought forward some of the families to engage in the programme. So this Easter, we managed to deliver 100 Easter packs to 75 families. This include a variety of learning and activities for them to take part with their children. Um, we had a target of reaching 75 families across three years. We've reached over 100 in just year one. 67 families are signed up to these ACORN activities, get regular uh, feedback, regular newsletters, regular support from the staff on the programme. And we've managed to achieve a, a really impressive uh, number of hours of home learning uh, for those children, something that's fundamental in developing skills for them. Quite crucially, as I said, a strong partnership with the school and we're managing to get 62% of referrals so far through from them to the programme. So the structure is working. It's about how we take it through to the next phase and continue to embed some of these and create sustainability and support for those families. So moving away from the ACORNS programme and focusing on the other three that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. So as I said, we have historically delivered a grants programme of uh, £500,000 plus, uh, but we're looking to revise the way we do this. So we've ring fenced 120 of that annually, and that takes two key focuses. Firstly, is the focus on recovery after the pandemic and supporting community groups to be able to deliver their services. Some have taken to Zoom, delivering activities on there. Some have slightly had to adapt the way they work. Some take things outside, but some have got increasing demand on their services because health and wellbeing issues and needs have grown throughout the, the past 12 months. And there's greater pressure on these organisations. So we're now supporting as part of the second strand there, we're supporting other uh, charitable organisations predominantly to be able to support with some of the longer term impacts that the pandemic has had in the community and effectively allowing us to to reach out into the community through these other partners to address need and um, put some of these programs in place particularly in areas such as food provision and health and well-being we're also taking a, a new approach, uh, quite a dynamic approach to the way we use some of our grant money now. And we're shifting from a grants focus where people would apply to us for, uh, for, for grant money to a position where we flip it on its head and we say, actually, we'll use the evidence and the data to determine the needs and we'll commission services over a longer period of time to embed uh, and support some of the needs within the communities. This is still at the very early phases. There's a meeting going on concurrently to this one where uh, the team are talking about areas to focus on, but we've got three possibilities here we're looking at. Unemployment, particularly amongst 18 to 24 year olds. We've got some high levels of unemployment in a couple of wards uh, within the town. Adult mental health, you'll all be aware of the impact on people's mental health. 
but also the impact that then has on them creating and generating work employment opportunities or volunteering opportunities and potentially a citizenship program as well to support young people uh, to develop their personal skills. And the final area is social action, something quite new to us. But one of the things we really recognised through the pandemic was the community and how it engaged, how people volunteered, how people supported, how people checked on their neighbours, how they set up local programmes down their street, growing programmes or food provision programmes. It was quite overwhelming, actually, the, the level of support, particularly that we saw in Letchworth. So we're now trying to harness this and to try and see how we can develop a programme that supports them. There's many programmes nationally that do support social action. We've been working with some of those partners to try and identify and implement a model on a neighbourhood level that can provide tools, resources and supports for some of those local uh, individuals who are willing to commit time, willing to be our social action ambassadors. And alongside this, we'll look to create a community connector role to be able to glue this all together and to create opportunities for our local communities. That is a very quick whistle stop tour of what we're doing and a spotlight on the ACORNS project. I hope that's been of use. As I said at the start, families are, are really important to us. Um, the programmes that we're delivering now, not only through that community support programme, but through the other programmes in the arts, culture, heritage and the commercial venues, and now really starting to focus on how we can support families as well as some of the, the more vulnerable families within the town. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very David, and it's good. Yes, thank you, um, David and Stuart. It's really interesting to see your data uh, driven approach um, and also how as planners we're so often so focused on the initial planning of a community, but to have an example like Letchworth um, to see how uh, you, you need to uh, kind of commit to settlements kind of in the long term um, is fascinating. Um, I'm going to hand over to Beth and Alexia now for the question and answer session. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, just to start with, David, as a uh, planner that's working in Culture to Borough Council on the um, garden community in North Essex, I think I will be very much taking you up on your offer of coming to Letchworth for a look round when we're able to. Um, so turning to your uh, presentations, thank you both for very insightful. I just wondered maybe more for Stuart. Um, from the various elements in the strategic plan that you've just been talking about, is there one in particular that you think will have the biggest impact to the younger community of Letchworth? Or is it a case of all of the elements together will have the biggest impact on the younger communities? Yeah, I think it's possibly too early to say for definite on that i mean you know your, your your second comment there i'd like to say that it would be all of them contributing but i really believe that social action is the biggest challenge to us in this the one that we hold uh, for want of a better word less control over and that's one that we really are relying on the community to come forward and say to us we're interested we want to take part i'd like to think that as a result of the pandemic this uh, community giving uh, this activism that's, that we've seen across you know, most of the world will continue, but we don't quite know how the community is going to return when a new normal life uh, descends upon us. So this is the one that's possibly most in question for us in terms of how we can embed that and how we can generate the level of interest that we have over the last year. Um. Hi, uh, thank you both for your presentations. Um, very insightful. Um, uh, my question is also for Stuart. Um, regarding the unemployment rate for um, younger people in Letchworth, what kind of opportunities do you think you'd be able to create in the future to cover that need? Yeah, sure. So it's something we're looking at immediately, Alexia. We've um, we've very much embraced the government's kickstart program. We've taken on some kickstart placements ourselves. Some of them are starting Monday morning, which is great. So we'll we'll start to see some young people working within the organisation. We've also undertaken a campaign locally with some of our key partners, our housing providers, the district council, the local uh, LEP who are supporting us to campaign to get other organisations to take on kickstart placements. But we're also working with local training providers to look at apprenticeships, 
modern apprenticeships and other methods for people, young people to get the skills that are necessary to move into employment. I think the difficulty that we have within Letchworth, and, and David will probably want to comment after this as well, is that many of our employment opportunities are low skilled. So this caters for a certain amount of our uh, population, but it's possibly one of the reasons why people choose to move away from the town when they get to the 18 to 24 age range, because there isn't the employment opportunities within. But I know that's something we're addressing through our housing plans, David. Yes, yeah, thanks, Stuart. Yes, so um, what we're very keen keen to ensure is that the expansion of Letchworth, so there's going to be about 1,500 new dwellings um, in the next 10 to 15 years uh, being developed in Letchworth, and we're keen to make sure that we maximise the community benefit. Now, there's two ways that will happen. Firstly, from reinvestment of the capital we seek, because we own the land outright, so that, that gives a huge opportunity for Stuart and his team to be able to undertake further programmes but also more directly um, to make sure that there, there are opportunities linked to that development. So, for example, we are partnering with the local college, North Hearts College, and we'll be ensuring that the developers will be providing a whole range of training programmes provided through the college um, and not just in terms of traditional trades and, and traditional sort of apprenticeships and carpentry and so forth. That would be part of it but to also, also ensure, ensure that we embrace opportunities around administration, surveying, sales, all of those associated skills to try to maximise the benefit from, from those, those housing development schemes. So we're setting something up that will basically say that if you want to build on our land, you cannot do so unless you invest in young people in, in our area. There'll be a Letchworth first criteria, but also we'll be uh, working with with uh, local services to ensure that uh, people who are seeking uh, retraining, long term unemployed and so forth also benefit from that. That will be provided on the main sites uh, for what we're hoping to be an on site provision, um, but also we will be pooling uh, contributions on smaller sites to ensure that they also make a contribution to these programmes. And we're hoping that that will be a very sustainable way of doing it. There are also opportunities around uh, some parts of the schemes. For example, we're very much promoting self-build um, as part of our developments, going back to some of the early days in Letchworth. And I'm very keen that, that there will be opportunities for young people to get involved with that by coming up with socially rented self-build models that are attractive to younger people, as well as the traditional sort of self-build model. So there's a few different sort of strands to how we're hoping to support. That, that's wonderful. <laughs> that actually sounds like a very good way forward to include young people as well. Thank you. Thank you. OK, excellent. I think we will um, move on now to um, Milton Keynes, but thank you very much again to David and to Stuart and to Beth and Alexia and way we look forward to hearing your reflections um, at the end of the session. But um, we'll hot pot it to Milton Keynes and to Heather Pugh. Um, Heather is a chartered town planner with 25 years experience um, in planning practice. Um, and as I said, a, a partner at David Locke Associates. She has extensive experience in planning and delivering large scale developments, uh, most notably at Hampton's in Great Haddon in Peterborough, uh, which is a combined uh, new community of over 13,000 uh, 13, homes. She has uh, combined her interest in geography, long term planning and placemaking to develop a specialism in strategic spatial planning and has num uh, led a number of growth studies for local authorities, including um, notably the Oxford to Cambridge arc. And she provides expert witness at examination and a range of large scale urban extensions and new settlements um, for a range of different clients. So she's going to give us an overview of um, Milton, Milton Keynes. So over to you, Heather. Thank you, Charlotte. Good morning, Way. Good morning, everybody. I'll share my screen. There we go. So uh, I'll just preface this um, presentation by saying I, I've come at this from a variety of perspectives. So in addition to the, um, the nice welcome that Charlotte's given me, um, I'm not a Milton Keynes native like many people here. Um, I moved 30 years ago from Yorkshire down here. Uh, I am mum to teenagers who are Milton Keynes natives and have grown up here. 
And I'm also vice chair of governors at one of the largest secondary schools in Milton Keynes. So I have some sort of first hand experience of some of the pressing issues for the young planet, uh, the young people and families here in Milton Keynes, as well as my sort of planning profession. Um, so my my um, perspective in answering the, the exam question, which was as a planned settlement, how does Milton Keynes contribute to family life? Uh, I come at this from a variety of uh, perspectives. Now, many people, including Way, will know a lot about the, the new town of Milton Keynes. So what I'm going to do is really just look at, look at what the original aims of the new town were for families. Um, what does family mean in a Milton Keynes context today? And then how is sort of planning activity in Milton Keynes at the moment and going forward supporting family life? Really, the, the original aims of the new town for families, um, it, it's very interesting that obviously you, you a lot of you will recognise the, uh, the plan for Milton Keynes. Um, it was planned um, for the sort of end state from the outset. It was master plan led. It was polycentric, which means really that um, a lot of these centres of activity were not all in the centre. They were scattered around the new city. And that's actually been one of the fundamental issues which we're now having to deal with today, particularly for families. Um, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, it was of its time in terms of it was, it was low density um, and it was planned for carbon travel at the time. Um, but it was specifically designed to attract families out of London. Uh, one of the original ethos for the new town was to uh, decant families really from overcrowded um, sort of suburbs of London into the green fields of Buckinghamshire. Um, and this, this, this next slide really sort of sums up. This is one of the original planning adverts for, for Milton Keynes. And Milton Keynes did a huge campaign in terms of attracting both um, residents and businesses to the new city. Um, with a, a real focus uh, on um, the the green infrastructure side of the city, so coming out from the from the cities into the countryside, and actually um, the the goals. These were the original goals, seven goals for Milton Keynes, and I would say the majority of those are as applicable today as they were then. So um, I think there was a lot of foresight in terms of planning for Milton Keynes. Um, that you can see in planning uh, discussions today, particularly about the attractiveness of the city and the Building Beautiful campaign, um, the movement and access in terms of mobility um, and the efficient and imaginative use of resources, which was um, I think is, has come to the fore again as we're looking at now how to fund infrastructure, uh, both social and um, uh, sort of physical. Um, but what does family mean in a Milton Keynes context today? I mean, where we get to, the new city now um, has reached its original planned size. Um, and it, it, in actual fact, it's now looking and they're already developing some expansion areas. Um, some parts of the city have matured very well, the green infrastructure and the landscape. Other aspects of the city are still in their infancy as far as sort of conventional towns go. So, for example, Central Mont Keynes being only 50 years old is quite new for a city centre. A lot of our city centres are hundreds of years old and have developed into in a much more fine grain and um, organic way. Um, and so some part, parts of the city still have a, a way to go in terms of the full range of community, social and cultural diversity. Um, Families now are the second generation of Milton Keynes locals. So we we really that people now are embedded. We have more settled communities. We're more diverse culturally um, than the original new town. People in Milton Keynes are generally supportive of growth, provided that it's well planned. And I think we're starting to see now that the the planning system as it as it now is is not particularly um, conducive to long term spatial planning. We know that, and I think somebody referenced the garden communities in North Essex. We know how difficult it is to get really strategic growth through local plans and through the local plan examination system. Um, so there's some tensions there between wanting to plan for the next 50 years and being able to do so. Um, but I think what also uh, is interesting to me is that we have a very different demographic context from what was originally envisaged in Milton Keynes. Um, and in many aspects, rather than the mixed community, which was originally envisaged for Milton Keynes, Milton Keynes increasingly has characteristics of a two tier city. And it's really interesting to hear Simon's comments on Letchworth because we've got a lot of the same issues um, where the life chances and the opportunities for um, residents are um, very different. Um, I've just put some statistic up here on the slide. Um, now more than a quarter of our residents are from a, a BAME background. 
And for secondary school children, and this is where my sort of uh, other life comes into account, that's up to 40% in some of our schools. So we've got a very different characteristic for the young people in Milton Keynes, growing up in Milton Keynes, and it's a very different life experience for them. Um, we have an average life expectancy difference of eight years between our richer and our poorer residents, which is a lot in a single city. We have a quite surprising um, obesity and overweight issue in Milton Keynes. Surprising because we have a lot of green infrastructure uh, and we have a lot of redways, cycle routes, pedestrian cycle, but the access to that infrastructure and the ability of the lower income communities to sort of access the wider opportunities of Milton Keynes is actually quite telling. And we have a homelessness problem. Um, the, to an extent, this has been addressed through the pandemic. We've had the council have done some excellent work in terms of housing the homeless during the pandemic, but we've got a high homelessness issue and that's to do with the housing affordability and the change in tenure between what was originally envisaged in the city, which was a sort of um, a social social rent to a sort of 50-50 split of social rent and owner occupied, um, occupied housing. And it's now around 80% um, owner occupied. And one in four children lives below the poverty line after housing costs, which for a new city in the arc, I think is is um, a pretty sort of horrifying statistic. Um, and it's one that perhaps isn't immediately obvious. So what is um, the council and local stakeholders doing about this? Well, um, in 2015, 2016, the MK Futures Commission was established. Now this importantly, it wasn't planning led and the commissioners are, are a combination of experts in their field and those with a strong connection to Milton Keynes. So it wasn't driven um, wholly by the council. Uh, it was really a collection of, of the sort of the great and the good uh, in terms of looking at the next 50 years beyond 50 years of growth for Milton Keynes. Um, what the commission did is did an in-depth analysis in Milton Keynes, looking at the demographics, education and skills, mobility and health. And I think they were determined that the growth for Milton Keynes, so planning for the growth of, of Milton Keynes in its widest sense um, of planning, was looking really at um, drivers such as education and mobility as fundamental to the, the future prosperity of the city, uh, as well as planning for the spatial planning and the technological change that we might envisage. The Commission came up with six big projects and it's important that these these projects have a planning element, but they're not driven by planning. They're cross departmental, they're multidisciplinary uh, and they involve many more organisations and groups than those usually engage with engage with with planning and design. Um, you can see I mean, you might just be able to read the green lettering. Uh, the project one, which I'll talk about a bit more, is about growth and strategy. But the there's an MK University learning 2020 is about education and skills. Smart shared mobility is about looking at the mobility proposition for Milton Keynes. Um, Renaissance MK is looking about the city centre in the future. And then the culture, uh, the creative and cultured city is about developing our, our, our cultural uh, offer and our cultural diversity. Um, project one, which is the growth and strategy, and this is where um, David Lock Associates, my company, looked at um, a strategic growth study. And I'll do a plug that we won the planning awards for placemaking uh, last year for this study. And it's really important. It's part of the evidence base for um, what is now the adopted Milton Keynes uh, 2050 strategy. And it's important to look like its overall overarching objecting, uh, objective was defining what good growth looks like. And the key driver was delivering beneficial outcomes to existing as well as new communities. So not just looking at the shiny new stuff on the edge of Milton Keynes, but looking at how investment in growth and development can feed back into overall better outcomes for the city as a whole. Um, and again, it's important that this document um, is not a statutory spatial plan. It's a non-statutory um, growth strategy for the town and because of that it's been able to be taken forward through public consultation and adopted essentially as corporate strategy of the council so it feeds into equally into education policy housing policy um, leisure policy as well as just being um, the sort of precursor for local plan activity going forward and I think that's a really important point to make because I know a lot of other strategic growth studies have, have fallen foul of the system by looking to do um, to, to be embedded in statutory planning we had to have a, um, a nod to the targets, the numbers, the growth. Um, and, you know, you can see there that the, the needs, the, the housing needs are, are, are some 30 to 35,000 uh, additional homes. 
Um, importantly, including for those residents already living in the city. Um, but as importantly, was looking at the um, the people, you know, growth is primarily about people. Uh, you don't grow just to build new houses. You grow to house your people, your communities, your um, your employers. Uh, the, the, the document I've referenced there is the Vital Signs. It's produced by Milton Keynes Community Foundation. And each year it does a review of the demographics of Milton Keynes, the statistics around and the, the, the statistics I quoted uh, were from this Vital Signs report. And that was one of the key drivers to look at what outcomes we uh, the growth strategy might need to look at and to resolve. I won't dwell on these images. Um, you can look at the MK Futures website to have a look at this, but these, really these images is just to emphasize the fact that we, we looked at um, a whole town approach to growth. So we looked at not just the, if I call it the yellow custard around the edges, uh, we not just the growth area, but looking really at connecting neighborhoods through the city, through some of the older estates that are in need and now have been earmarked for some regeneration work, looking at the maturing estates that are predominantly um, so family housing, but housing now um, children that are going into their teenage years and connecting new communities back into the places that need to go and to need to access. Um, we also looked at um, the green infrastructure for Milton Keynes, looking at what we could do in terms of connecting the the very extensive green infrastructure that already exists into a a bigger proposition for the town as a whole to be able to access this really sort of um turned into this is the milk Keynes strategy which is now adopted where they have um identified seven big ambitions and they're not all about planning but planning has a role to play in each of those ambitions um and it does as i said earlier it functions it filters down into healthcare strategy regeneration strategy um, as well as local plan making. What I'll just do now is just to, to flick through some of the, um, the visuals that we prepared as part of the growth study. One of the key challenges for us is to get community and uh, sort of residents buy in to um, what some people perceive um, as being done to them. So, and particularly when it affects the existing areas, because the growth study looked at how we could um, intensify or redevelop some of the existing parts of Milton Keynes, as well as look at the outside. It look, it really demonstrates to us the, the importance of planning in new communities for future proofing, for future uh, eventualities. So for example, this is the grid road system in Milton Keynes. Uh, it's a, this is one of the dual carriageway grid roads. And mobility is one of the primary drivers for good growth going forward. 25% of Milton Keynes people don't have access to a car. So looking at the grid roads, it works brilliantly for cars. And again, the polycentricity of the city works brilliant for getting around, you know, or going into the centre and out again at night. But 25% of people can't access um, this um, infrastructure and it doesn't work well for public transport because it's not all going into the centre and coming out again. So one of the things we looked at was was Milton Keynes rapid transit, and you'll see here is a is a, um, a repurposing of one of the grid roads for um, rapid transit, and it's road based rapid transit. But it, it importantly, the vehicle is is not necessarily important. It's about the priority that's given to it to get um, really uh, in and in and out and around the city uh, in prioritised over the the private car. This is looking at a stop at an intersection where the local uh, the, the local streets meet the grid roads, so it's accessible to the local populations. Again, you'll see here, this is the um, the sort of right hand side of where the road is next to the road is a green, a green strip, which is the future proof grid corridor. We can repurpose that to look at introducing uh, rapid transit into there again with some re selective redevelopment of um, some of the underused spaces around that tram stop. Um, similarly, the the two green areas in the centre of that slide are um, Milton Keynes was very good at reserving sites for future community uses or future uses um, as yet undetermined. So it's it, this is it within a developed area of Milton Keynes, but those two um, sort of green areas now, if if uh, when you introduce um, some some um, sort of the the rapid transit. Um, mobility, accessibility, you can look at redeveloping some of those areas uh, to a slightly higher degree of intensity of use and introduce an, an, a degree of vibrancy that sometimes is missing in some of the estates that are predominantly housing. 
Again, um, this is one of the regeneration uh, estates um, in Milton Keynes that was originally built and is now sort of uh, really in need of some improvements and regeneration to the built fabric. Again, the grid road running down the middle is looking at um, uh, how you might sort of link these two communities through access to, um, to better public transport. And also um, building on this sort of 15, 20 minute neighbourhood with the walkable centre uses, so looking at the walkable um, local centres to reintroduce that without wholesale regeneration, to look at, at connecting communities better and giving them a focus for their day-to-day -day activities. And then we also looked at some very sort of small scale but um, effective uh, reprioritisation. Uh, one of the, the great things about Milton Keynes is its redway system, which is a, a segregated uh, pedestrian and cycle network throughout the city and, it, and it's it's well used um but not as well used as it could be and one of the reasons for that is that it is um still sort of secondary to the predominancy of the private car so simply looking at a reprioritization of the redways so that actually ped cycle and non-motorized vehicles get priority of the car would make that a much better and um attractive system for people particularly families to use just lastly, looking at um, how whole communities might benefit. Now, this is Bletchley, and those of you all uh, have taken an interest in East West Rail will really have looked at the fact that Bletchley was one of the stopping stations on the new East West Rail. Um, there's already platforms being put in to connect the, the West Coast Main Line with the East West Rail um, line. Um, but there are some great opportunities here for the wider community of Bletchley to access um, opportunity as well as physically access the, the railway. Um, but at the moment, we've got, um, you'll see in the sort of, uh, in the towards the top of the image, uh, there's some fairly sort of big blocks of um, sort of 1960s redevelopment that effectively block off the high street from the rail stations. And um, one of the identification of the of the whole community regeneration of Bletchley is looking at how we might re repurpose and open up um, access for the, the existing community to some of the benefits that might arise from, from East to West Rail particularly. And lastly, we, we had to demonstrate that some of the iconic uh, Milton Keynes infrastructure wouldn't sort of be ripped up um, to accommodate changes in technology and, and mobility. So this is just a, a sort of a, an artist's uh, image of how the uh, the public transport and the, the rapid transit system in Milton Keynes can be accommodated within the existing iconic infrastructure of Milton Keynes. That's the growth study. What I also just wanted to talk, touch about was about some innovations in planning and delivery that Milton Keynes has developed um, throughout its sort of new town history, but also is carrying forward today. Um, the first of that is the Milton Keynes Parks Trust model. And I think one of the things to say, I think people will have, will have heard about this and the TCPA um, are, are sort of heavily looking at how this model can be um, held up as an example of, of um, something that new communities might want to look at going forward. Um, the model is the Parks Trust is an independent charity and, and it cares for the 6,000 acres of, of uh, green space in Milton Keynes. Uh, it was created in 1992, so it was actually created as part of the legacy um, of the new town as it looked to take take it forward as the new town was starting to get wound up. Um, and it was it was really it was endowed with a substantial property and investment portfolio. And the income from this portfolio pays for the um, the work of nurturing and enhancing the landscaping. And they're entirely self-financing. Um, but it is proving difficult now for the Parks Trust to take on some of the um, the land outside the original development area for the new town, uh, because obviously the private sector is bringing that forward and um, there is no um, compulsion to use the Parks Trust um, as the as the um, the infrastructure body or the, the governance body to look after those new spaces. So there's a there's a big um, uh, push really to try and look at how uh, the Parks Trust can be embedded as the um, as the sort of primary um, curator of the the green infrastructure for Milton Keynes going forward as it expands beyond the development area. Um, Obviously, the, the the activities for families within the Parks Trust, I mean, the Parks Trust does a huge amount um, for all sectors of the community from um, the park runs, from the education of, of, um, of uh, school aged children um, and uh, sort of community litter picking and actually getting the older people back into the um, to walking and uh, enjoying the green infrastructure so that they, they do an awful lot with families. The. Um, 
the other one is to talk about is Milkings tariff. Now, again, the tariff um, is something that um, it has in common with Letchworth. Um, it's a debt based forward funding model and it provides infrastructure against assumed income from planning obligations. So it's really, again, another legacy project that looks at when the new town was wound up, how can we uh, continue to capture uh, money from new development and plow it back into a whole town um, set of, of, of um, community and, and social infrastructure and Community Action MK, the slide there is just one of the organisations that the tariff funds. So in addition to funding the, the usual section where six obligations, it funds wider community. I'll just I'm conscious of time, so I'll just quickly flick to one of the current projects that looking at is repurposing land within Milton Keynes to meet changing needs. And for those of you that know Milton Keynes, you'll recognise this slide is actually of the aerial is upside down. So south is to the top of the slide. This is one of the um, underused golf courses in Milton Keynes. Um, uh, we've got the existing community of Bletchley to the to the left of your slide and the new community of Tattenhoe to the right. Um, it's within the city, but it's adjacent to planned new developments. Um, and it's it's next to um, existing what we, we've termed adolescent estates, where many families have teenagers, but very little walkable access to indoor sport facilities. So one of uh, the, the council is looking at, um, looking with a, a charitable organisation um, and who are sort of linking with um, a developer to look at how we might repurpose that golf course to include, a, to create a, a, a sort of multi-sport sports hub. So a hub for a range of sporting facilities, still including an 18 hole golf course, but also um, looking at how we might integrate um, a house and number of the existing uh, MK grassroots sports clubs uh, currently without a home or with um, underused facilities and particular emphasis on sports for families and teenagers, first time sports tasters, um, getting back into sport for those people that can't access sport or have, have lost uh, the impetus for sport, but also looking at, at the grassroots centre. We've got some centres of excellence, the LTA and the cricket, uh, North Hans Cricket Club are looking at uh, how they might grow grassroots um, centres of excellence for young people here. So I think it's it, that's a bit of a canter through some of the um, some of the things that Milton Keynes is doing. But I hope it gives you a taste of the breadth of activity in Milton Keynes, which is um, ongoing to, to really address the changing needs of its families now and into the future. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Heather. I'll just end slides now. There we go. I'll stop. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen if I can do that. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much, Heather. That was um, a fascinating look at um, how planned settlements can build in that flexibility to meet the change in needs. And there's a planner that works in a more traditional historic area of Cambridge. Um, the difference is absolutely stark about how it allows you to um, have that adaptability. Mm. I'm going to move on then to uh, hand over to uh, Graham Wilson and Susie Green, our young planners from the South East, to lead the question and answer. Hi everyone, um, Heather, I think we're actually quite well paired on this one. So I'm someone that actually grew up in Milton Keynes. Oh, so <laughs> I think, yeah, it kind of works quite well there. Um, so obviously listening to your presentation is interesting and I'm obviously working within a similar context to you. Um, and so I suppose, you know, growing up, I had access to something like six play parks, which is virtually unfounded because of things like the Parks Trust. Mm -hmm. So you touched on it briefly, but how do you think these kind of um, innovations that we've seen in Milton Keynes can actually be replicated elsewhere and kind of brought brought into fruition for others benefits that's a really good question and um i think that you know the parks trust model i think is 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 probably um not undervalued but i think the the uniqueness of the model is is, is actually um is, is proving quite difficult to replicate um and i think because of the the um lack of ability to sort of capture um the ownership of land and the governance of land. I think um, the model can be replicated to a certain degree in terms of local governance models. So endowing um, a management company with, uh, for example, um, property or, or something um, similar can allow it to sort of fund a development area. So I think that model at an individu individual development and a strategic development level works. I think it's proving very difficult to uh, expand that to whole town or whole community models. I, but 
uh, I think having said that, the the garden communities movement, you know, the first bullet on the garden community, um, the garden village and garden city is the land value capture and actually the control of land. And I think if we can deal with that in some of our, our large scale um, sort of garden communities going forward uh, and new settlements going forward, we might be able to embed that from the outset because I think it is, it is important. But it does mean taking a long term view of um, sort of expenditure and receipts. So what we term a sort of patient capital approach to development where actually you have to invest for a few years before you see the, the receipts coming back. Uh, and that I think is quite difficult for some of the um, the larger developers to embrace, although the master, the, the, those developers that are embracing a master developer role, I think are much more um, open to this level of sort of governance and long term legacy. Um, but I, it's it's very difficult, I think, in without some legislation to sort of make that happen or to enable that to happen. Um, it has to be done sort of on a on an individual negotiated basis. Yeah, um, and I suppose another question that I have um, kind of touches on some of the things that you've talked about in terms of the changing demographic profile that we have in Milton Keynes. And and as you said, that we're seeing generations come through who are now actually, you know, first generation Milton Keynes is second generation Milton Keynes. Is. Um, but we're also having quite a big affordability issues in Milton Keynes yeah. in terms of people buying homes or even renting in Milton Keynes. And we've seen affordable housing in terms of shared ownership models being um pioneered and really prevalent in Milton Keynes. How do you think in terms of the strategy moving forward, we can make it so that families can continue to thrive and maybe not have all their money going out on rent and mortgage payments? Yeah, that's that's a really, a really good and it, and it hits home actually. We, we've in recent years, um, a number of our um, graduate employees or even even, even the, the planners that, that live uh, that were trying wanting to live in Milton Keynes can't afford to buy a house here. So they're moving up to Northampton and outside Milton Keynes, which it, it you know in 30 years that that is really stark. It never used to be like that when I started housing was relatively affordable and it was some 25 years ago. So it's a, a relatively recent problem I think and, and as as, as uh, in terms of going forward I think what the uh, the Milton Keynes sort of growth study and strategy looked at is particularly a much bigger role for the council in building houses and investing in in um, both the rental sector but also also house building themselves and there's a number of initiatives in Milton Keynes um, looking because the um, the the sort of legacy uh, agencies and the development corporation still own quite a lot of land so Milton Keynes Development Partnership still owns quite a lot of land in Milton Keynes um, and um, the the issue, I think, is is that we, this is what we talked to the ministry about. The issue is that the public agencies now have to get best value for their land, and best value translates as monetary value. Um, and I think there's there's now starting to be a move away from actually what is best value. And in this context, best best value is not necessarily the most money for the land. So looking at how we redefine what best value is will allow uh, these agencies and the councils themselves to build for the demographic that they need. So I think one of one of those uh, the key issues is to look at how the how public agencies um, can define best value and how the, the receipts and how Treasury can can look at that in terms of going forward. There is work, I think, being done on that. Um, and hopefully it would be more. And some authorities around the um, around the country are, are really exploring this in a bit more way. And I hope that Milton Keynes Council can can do that, start to look at a, a much more a bigger council house programme of, of building and building the houses that the community and the, the particularly the young people need. Yeah, and I suppose one one final question, and again, this touches on the kind of the changing diversity, particularly of the younger demographic in Milton Keynes. Um, looking at m maybe the planners that actually operate in Milton Keynes, I think that when I look at the people, we, I don't think we're a particularly diverse group. So whilst we try and make our profession more diverse, what can we be doing to engage the different groups in Milton Keynes to ensure that they have, um, you know, the, the younger people, um, people from different backgrounds actually have the input into what's happening to change Milton Keynes moving forward? That's a really good question. This is where my two worlds collide because as part of my school governor role, um, the, the secondary schools I'm involved in have, have contributed to the MK2050 growth campaign. And there is a the Learning 2050 objective, which is part of the one of the council's six big projects, is looking specifically at that, um, getting young people into the built environment, careers and industry. Milton Keynes doesn't have a university, so it loses a lot of 18 year olds out of Milton Keynes and not many of them come back. Um, so the Milton Keynes University, um, the, the proposition for the university has a big built environment um, and STEM um, 
sort of offer. That's what they're, they're growing their offer. So and what you know, and we're in a way in contrast to Oxford and Cambridge that are looking at the very academic side of, of um, sort of higher education. Milton Keynes is almost becoming a living lab. So testing out what's what, what is being learned on the ground. And I think that's quite exciting for for young Milton Keynes people. They can see things happening around them all the time. There's a fast changing city um, and we're doing a lot of, of work in terms of going into schools and talking to young people about planning as a career or architecture as a career um, and um, design as a career. And because they can see it happening around the doorstep, they're quite engaged. So we've had quite a lot of, of, of education um, projects that look at growth of Milton Keynes and that engage with the 2050, um, the future strategy. Again, it's about broadening it to explain that planning's not just about town planning, <laughs> it's about growth and about engagement and about community um, and all those things feed together and they feed together into the planning system and then out again. So it's it's really trying to trying to get that across. And I think you're right. I think it's about the profession as a whole, um, drawing that, you know, look at actually what some of us get involved in under the planning heading. And actually, it's a very, very broad church um, and, and it's very interesting um, in terms of what you get involved in. OK, thank you, um, Susie and Heather. I'm going to pass over to Graham um, to lead our uh, panel discussion. And I'd like to invite um, our presenters um, to join us on the screen by turning their cameras on. Um, we've made it to uh, just gone five minutes past 11, so if we can have um, up to 15 minutes of, of questions, Graham, um, and then I'm uh, looking forward to handing over to Wei for her reflections. But Wei, obviously, um, your contributions and questions in the panel discussion, um, welcome as well. So over to you, Graham. Thank you. Um, I hope you can see me. I have been having technical difficulties this morning, so bear with me if I uh, do have further issues. Um, I think if we start with uh, uh, Heather touched on uh, an issue with the difficulty in strategic planning and trying to um, yeah, predict predict the future within the context of a local plan without the ability to sort of formally strategic plan. So um, I think if we start with Heather, you know, the, what could be gained from a greater um, a, a sort of strategic planning approach, and then sort of move move across to uh, Stuart and David and, Sue and how that would uh, apply to Letchworth. Yeah, I think it, that on the strategic planning side, I think you, you've got almost two scales of, of planning. You've got this sort of the, the whole town approach to growth, which I think is 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 something that is I touched on is, is, is wider than planning. So I, th I think on that basis, I think it's it's embedding your local plan objectives in a wider set of corporate policies so that actually when you get to delivering on the local plan objectives, you're not having sort of pulls in different direction from your housing department or your education department or your transport plan so actually everybody's engaged with that's the outcome we want we need to embed all the, that forward planning in all of our corporate policy documents not just the local plan because we, we all know it's system you know we all know developments where we've gone and we've said we we want to do this well you can't do that because that's not in our that, you know that's not the focus of our strategy or our objectives so we quite often find that on the delivery on the ground it falls down because there's there's not that cross departmental so i think that's that's the whole city sort of approach to delivering strategically i think there's a, there's a whole other um seminar on on the the sort of strategic planning <laughs> debate <laughs> in terms of looking at at, at geographical areas and subregions and, and i'm a great favor of, of, of sort of the, the the regional planning um concept um, I understand why why it wasn't politically acceptable in in, uh, in in the last 20 years. And we've got ourselves into a place where everybody's trying to do regional planning. Um, but the tensions between authorities, the tensions between uh, the, the difficult political makeup of, of adjoining authorities is now known. And I think some of the initiatives like the ARC Spatial Framework is looking really as much about the the democratic governance of these places as it is about the spatial plan. So, you know, who is the decision making body? Who can give enough certainty over strategic infrastructure, strategic environmental priorities to say this transcends local plan making? This is something that we will sign up to. We will make decisions in accordance with this plan for the next 20 years and we will be the overarching body that makes that decisions. Now, whether the government is the most appropriate, um, you know, there's as many people, different people with views on that as there are, as there are organisations in the arc. 
But essentially, I think it's really that the, the certainty over decision making of some of those big investment decisions will give certainty to um, planners and to and to the development industry to um, to deliver, you know, to actually say, well, we will plan for that good growth. We will plan for, you know, um, linking with East West Rail. We will plan for um, a water resource strategy that is going to come forward in the next 20 years because we know we've got an organisation that is driving that forward and is making decisions on that basis rather than it filtering down to individual local authorities who for you know for for, for lots of understandable reasons may find themselves wandering away from the original objectives and then it falls down because if, if one authority doesn't do it it all starts to fall down and unravel and I think then you get you know the worst of both worlds because you get local communities really disillusioned because they they've got the development but not the the infrastructure ambitions or the community or the environmental ambitions that they were sold as part of a, a big strategic plan. Thank you. Um, David or Stuart, who would like to yeah, I, I, I feel that from I, a network I, perspective? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with absolutely everything that, that Heather's just said. I, I think uh, what, the benefit from uh, garden communities and, and our new town legacy was by having a single uh, overarching organisation, be it in our case, uh, the Heritage Foundation or First Garden City Limited, and then the uh, Urban Development Corporations uh, and the Development Corporations for the New Towns. And that does make such a difference because you really do need this overarching body to take a lead on these things. Now, clearly, it's all about working collaboratively, bringing the right partners in, but also creating certainty. And it is so difficult with a disparate uh, group of landowners trying to, to create that framework which provides that certainty and taking a more strategic approach. I think also that the lessons that you can take from, from both the, the presentations on, on Letchworth and uh, on Milton Keynes is his ability to take a long-term view. So that, that view that uh, a private developer w w just cannot take on, on the way that they're, they're, they are set up. And there's, there's no problem with that, but that this capability to have this body who can take a long term view, bring the right partners in at the right time and create a framework, but bring out the very best of planning. So being data led, speaking to people, engaging with the right stakeholders in the communities and then putting together a strategy which they can say will be delivered, but with enough um, with a framework which provides enough flexibility to be uh, slightly longer lasting than perhaps things which are too embedded and, and can't be moved. Anything you'd like to add, Stuart, or is going to? No, I mean, you know, David's comments. <laughs> from a non planner's perspective, just building on what David said there is, and going back to the presentation I delivered, it's about infrastructure and something we're trying to create is, is, is proper infrastructure, relationships with partnership, uh, with partners and understanding partners' long term and short term ambitions and, and how we create flexibility in that. You know, if you've, if you've got a system and a model and the partners on board, it's easy to be flexible. If they're not embedded and you're all disjointed, it's less easy to achieve. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, so question I come in. Um, how can garden community developments ensure affordable housing is delivered for single parent households, especially single mothers who are also often impacted by the gender pay gap? Um, I think it's the uh, ever vexing problem of affordable housing and what is affordable, but particularly in the context of gardens and community developments. Um, I think, David, if we go to you first. Yeah, I, I, I think that the benefit that, that certainly new garden communities have is the ability to plan at scale. And when planning at scale, um, it is far easier to introduce a whole range of uh, housing types, facilities, um, et cetera, uh, to meet, meet the community's needs. But I think that sometimes where these, these things fall down, and um, as a profession in the past, I think less so now, because I think we've learned lessons, is, is that we don't necessarily engage with the right people to understand what their needs are. And that, that engagement is absolutely essential. So again, sort of taking a, a data to really understand what, what the technical requirements are, but making sure we speak to the, the right people to understand what they're looking for. Um, and then to ensure that, that that's absolutely embedded in, in the briefs and the, and the frameworks uh, for, for these areas. We, we have a, a housing strategy in Letchworth and I sort of came up with one bit, one thing that's called right homes in right places, which sounds a bit political, like a political manifesto, but it, but it is it is a very simple approach to ensure that when we plan new places, we do provide the, the right type of accommodation in those places where people really need them to be. And, and I think that that's, that's really very important. 
but also planning at scale does enable us to embrace a whole range of tenures. And as in the Letchworth case, we, Letchworth is a tale of two cities. As Stuart's highlighted, we have significant pockets of deprivation, but also we have some wards which are in the top 10% most well off in the UK. And what we really need to be able to address this is just about managing group. And I think that we, we need to open our eyes to other other forms of tenures. Let's let's look at cooperative housing, community land trusts, which provides different opportunities for people to be involved with, with housing. And I think that with, there, there are lots of opportunities out there. Um, thank you. Um, the uh, move on to one that's the ever thankless task of predicting the future, which given that we've just been through or oh, still going through a uh, pandemic um, and there has been, by all accounts, a rush in the housing market as everybody clamours to get their own private outdoor space. Do we think there's going to be a change in the way in what families are wanting and families needing need to be a change in the way um, uh, homes for families are not so much provided but there needs to be more of a, uh, a suitable uh, outdoor own private space included not just a balcony on a third floor flat mm. um heather if i can come to you first yeah no i think I, i'm i'm sort of uh, this, this, this is where you know the, the proponents of Milton Keynes are sort of looking quite smug at this point because we for for a long time um, the the sort of lower density um, housing model in Milton Keynes was was a, a vilified really in terms of the 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 profligate use of land um, you know it's it, it was wasteful it didn't work um, and actually what we found in Milton Keynes is that the it's almost a microcosm of this new 15 minute neighbourhood where people have actually got immediate and a huge variety of access to open space literally on their doorstep um, and the open spaces in Milton Keynes are being much more um, well used than they ever have been um, for you know it's 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 it's, it's so busy it's, it's, it's much more busier on the on the sort of redways and the and the routes than, than the roads actually through the pandemic so you know it was the roads were the the infrastructure that stood empty um, where the, the the redways and the, and the paths and the the parks were, were full. Um, I think that there is, um, so, so in a way for Milton Keynes, access to public space has been very, very important, particularly in, the, in those areas where they don't have their own private space. Um, but a lot of Milton Keynes was also um, a test bed for some innovative housing types. Um, and um, so I think in, there's pockets in Milton Keynes, particularly through the sort of uh, the 70s and 80s, where, where housing was developed to, to just trial different models. So sort of roof gardens and terraces, you know, sort of they've got private space over the garages. Um, you've got sort of inverted houses where you've got sort of indoor indoor covered space on the on the on the ground floor. So there's lots of innovation in terms of housing. And I think we've lost this. Sadly, we've lost that through the this, the sort of volume house builder models that, that that are the go to for new 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 developments now. And I think, again, uh, referencing David, I think part of the new communities um, sort of model is to broaden that housing offer so that you actually uh, sort of test the building in of some flexibility in the house, the house itself, as well as as well as the community. Um, so, you know, the live work units, the studio over the garage, the, um, you know, the, the flats with communal space and with them um, serviced serviced apartments. So you have a copy shop on the corner or you have something that's there to help you work from home or to help you um, sort of adjust your commute. Um, so I think that there are there are some interesting examples in Milton Keynes of how the, the built fabric, as well as the the planning of neighbourhoods, can can really embrace the sort of post pandemic um, uh, world that we're we're living in. I, th I think it would be a, a dreadful shame if we didn't learn any lessons um, yeah. from this. If we look at um, sort of a bit of a historical context, but if you look at on the back of the Spanish flu pandemic in sort of 1917 to 1919, there was a whole phase and, and wave of garden cities that were developed on the back of that, where it became very clear that overcrowding uh, in communities was causing the spread of, of the flu. And there's one uh, one example in South Africa called uh, Pinelands on the edge of Cape Town, which was directly built in response to uh, Cape Town's uh, high mortality rate uh, during the, the Spanish flu. And we, we really do need to learn lessons. And uh, I think that the, the principles of flexibility in, in, in building design is absolutely crucial. And we're actually um, intrigued to see the perceptions of our local communities on, on how Letchworth performed 
uh, as a garden city uh, during the, the pandemic. And we're, we're in discussions, advanced discussions with the university to do a piece of research on that uh, so, that, so that we can gain an understanding. That's something that we're very keen to publish so that we can learn some of those lessons so that we, we plan, plan things in a, in a better way. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. I've had two more questions come in, and I do think that one we should should address. Uh, the came here first. Um, as adult mental health has come to the forefront, especially during the pandemic, how is or could support be provided in the future? Um, I who would like to take that because I feel that uh, mental health is certainly coming to the forefront. Needs to be uh, certainly needs to be addressed. That's one for me, and, and that largely sits through the five key elements of our strategy, Graham. So obviously taking an evidence and need based approach, we recognise the increase in impact that the pandemic has on people's mental health. Um, it was something that was there before. I think it was something that was bubbling and surfacing, something we'd been talking uh, regularly with local partners. We fund Mind, a local uh, mental health support charity, as well as some others to put on diversionary activities, but more so than ever, funders, uh, support agencies within the sectors that I operate in are looking at now how some health and well-being, arts, culture and heritage activities can support people's mental well-being on that uh, kind of enjoyment level. Um, but equally, we're now talking with partners and trying to create, again, that infrastructure around mental health to ensure that they're there are enough places, there are enough counselling hours, there is enough support, there's support in schools, there's support for families that people know where to go. I think, I hope so, I keep my fingers crossed that the stigma around it is starting to disappear and we're talking about it more and more, but the more we can get partners, the more we can make services available, the more we can and understand. And just a, a quick spotlight, David talked about the pandemic last year, something we set up was a community response service and what quickly came to the fore was the isolation that people were experiencing and the mental health impact that they was having. So we worked with a couple of local organisations to put in place volunteer support that consisted of a phone call a couple of times a week and now a visit to those people and engaging them with community groups. So there's a lot that's going on and absolutely it's risen to the fore. But I think it was there before and it's just about how we how we harness this and how we support people um, through this phase. And then the final thing to say on it really is that that point I made previously about the knock on effect that that has in terms of employment, lack of employment opportunities for someone that's already got some mental health issues, it further compounds the issues that they're having. So we're in a really difficult position where employment opportunities are relatively low. If they've got low skills, if they've got mental health issues, we need to put in those community support services around them. Thank you. And apologies to those questions we didn't get to, but we are a bit conscious of time. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Graeme. Um, I personally found this a fascinating um, presentation, lots of learning that I'll take back to my own work on strategic communities. Um, Wei, I'm going to hand over to you for your reflections, uh, which we're keen to hear. And then um, uh, uh, Simon will um, give us a, uh, a wrap up. But I'd like to say my personal thanks to all our speakers and to the young planners. Uh, for their presentations today. Over to you, Wei. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Hi. I first want to say thank you to all the speakers and the young planners uh, participate today. And also special thank you to our RTPI Southeast and East of England region by organizing this fantastic uh, event. You know, uh, Lechworth, Garden City and uh, Mutant Kings, I think they are very special to us. First of all, I think our founding members of RTPI had great connections with the Latchworth Garden City. So Thomas Adams, our first president, was a manager of Latchworth Garden City. And then Raymond Anvin, he was the, our second president. He was the master planner of Latchworth Garden City. And Ebenezer Howard himself was actually the first honorary member of the RTPI. So we have great connections. And in 1974, the RTPI's uh, Diamond Jubilee was celebrated uh, at an event in Lechworth. Actually, that's the year I was born. <laughs> so lots of connections. And uh, for my personal experience, uh, in 2004, I started my planning career in Mutant Kings, uh, working in David Locke Associates. So Heather was my colleague for seven years. So I met lots of great planners uh, in Mutant Kings. And also, I think uh, Mutant Kings is a great place for a town planner to live because as a resident and also a planner, you see two sides 
of the story, so you can really see what worked, what didn't work. I think that influenced me uh, quite a lot on my uh, practice. And also, I'm still a trustee of Milton King's City Discovery Center, so I, I really um, still very closely related to Milton King's. So um, today we have two excellent examples, Latchworth Garden City and the Milton King's, although one is called Garden City, one we call Milton King's New Towns. But I really think actually Milton King's is actually a new, newer model of Garden City. Mm -hmm. There are, I think, lots of great similarities between the two uh, cities. If we don't talk about the scale, talk about the essence of them. So I thought uh, there are five areas um, we can think about, say, there are cities with long-term visions. I think we can very see very clearly from your presentations. And also, they are both highly innovative cities. And they are open cities for all communities. And also, they coexist with nature. And also, as you said today, actually, although after, say, 117 years later, for Latchworth Garden City, and then uh, I think just over uh, 50 years, I think they are still actually city in uh, infantry uh, in many sense, like Heather said. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes people are being over criticized to a lot, to a lot of element of them. So they are still evolving cities for the 21st century. And actually today we are celebrating the International uh, Families Day. This year's theme is families and the new technologies. So I think um, I think we will also cover that in our talk because nowadays I think our family have become smaller and also we have more single parent families. So actually put a sharp focus on the issue of social social protection. So really how we can think about the the, the trend of future and how we can really fulfill that in our future uh, city development. I think fundamentally, um, use. It's always, say, uh, technology and society change. But I think actually planning fundamentally is people-centric. So good planning mm -hmm. can bring the best out of people. I think about what uh, Howard was putting in his uh, Garden City as a essence, because I think by creating a um, very social and uh, community-focused model, you can really bring the best out of people. There was a very interesting uh, study talk about the happiness of people. I think that's what uh, uh, Howard uh, really want to bring. It's called Howard. Uh, it's called Howard. Uh, uh, it's by, it was being done by Howard University in America. It's called Howard Grant Study. So actually, they took a group of the same people and then carried on the survey for seventy five years. It's quite the longest survey of the whole world. And then they found out the the result is a good life is built on good relationship. So I think that's, that's very much what Howard was trying to create is this social enterprise and the charity, charitable models. He was always uh, writing a book about uh, garden cities and uh, humanistic pure land during the pandemic last year. So actually the only two places I visited was Milton Kings and Latros Garden City uh, <laughs> last year. And uh, also interesting because I was counting how many charities there are in Latros Garden City. I think there are over 100 and then some of them were started from 100 years ago. So they are still there, like the original garden uh, community. So it's really about this close people relationship. Because we, I think as human beings, we have two types of characters. I think on the one hand, we are part of nature. Because I have to uh, get fresh air, I have to uh, drink fresh water. And then on the other hand, actually we're all um, part of social animal. So our family and our colleagues and our neighbors actually having a, Harmony relationship with them will make us happy, make us make us feel uh, more secure. So it's really, I think, creating city is really about creating the relationship between nature and the people and the society. So this is really something I want to uh, focus because I think technology evolves all the time. I think. Uh, Especially because of the pandemic, I think our digitization uh, and how things society has been moved very quickly on the digital element. And then, actually, I think you have digital access means you have access to uh, jobs, uh, education. Uh, you can buy things, and then you can now do lots of entertaining from uh, internet. But actually, that doesn't mean the physical element. So, if, for example, where I live, we only have one studio uh, in in my uh, apartment because. I normally go to London before, so we don't. We really only have a study room shared by myself and my husband. But now, because I'm having lots of Zoom calls, so I actually have to push my husband out to another <laughs> room. 
<laughs> so this, this physical space is still there. And also, I think um, location doesn't mean um, so this digital uh, uh, connections doesn't really mean you have access to fresh air and access to green space. So this makes the spatial equality very important. That's, I think, why, say, Letchworth Garden City and then Milton Kings, they are so unique because you have the green space on your doorstep. And also, I know Milton Kings did a lot in early days on the social infrastructure to create communities, community uh, charities to support local people. So I think it's a social element sometimes we don't see very clear uh, it's some. It's a very, very essential element we really want to bring out from the uh, the Garden City um, initiative. So I think these are some reflections from me. Uh, what I want to say is, uh, for example, what's, what normally uh, criticize uh, Milton Kings because it's sometimes is quite car uh, focused, um, but actually, I think. As uh, David said, we need to learn from our past mistakes. Because when technology evolves, we just focus on the technology and forget the people element. I think we have to really judge the both of them at the same time. Think about what is the essential requirement. Is the happiness we want to achieve? On the other hand, how we can use the technology, but not being used by technology. I think there are two different things. Mm -hmm. So it's really um, my reflection of today. It's really about our family values and really how we can think about family and the new technology to make sure actually we can really uh, bring the best for the future. I'm conscious of time, so I think that's my quick summary of <laughs> it's a, a good reflection of today's uh, talk. But thank you so much for, for your contribution. I really appreciate it. That's a great way. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. I know that I've been off camera for practically the whole of this session, but my name is Simon Taylor and I am the chair of the Southeast region. So it's nice to finally meet all of you. Uh, um, I think it's been great uh, the last hour and a half uh, having a canter through uh, uh, Letchworth and, and Milton Keynes. I've actually learned quite a bit uh, uh, from all of that, from uh, the, the land value capture and the reinvestment of the capital receipts and actually the importance of reinvesting uh, um, not in just physical infrastructure, but also the importance of actually investing into social infrastructure as well. And likewise, having that strategic overview of uh, um, of new towns and 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 taking that forward into the new principles of these new uh, uh, these new garden villages, these new garden communities that are slowly coming through the pipeline now is very important. We've touched upon uh, um, the successes of this, but also we've also touched on some of the challenges uh, that have come out through all of this. So uh, the governance arrangements of actually how do you actually fully integrate uh, um, a garden city or a, or a new town model when you've got multiple different uh, uh, interests, whether that be uh, um, the two tier authority system uh, um, to different landowners being being involved. Um, and also the fact that while we are, as a profession, very evidence driven, very data driven uh, uh, community, we shouldn't also forget the human element to all of this. So actually going out, speaking to people and actually making sure that we engage with the communities that we are trying to help the most. So I guess a question, a rhetorical question to leave with everybody today is uh, um, how do you go about engaging with young people and families in the planning system. I think that is probably one of the one of the main takeaways that I will be taking away uh, from this. So I think it's been a fantastic, uh, uh, a fantastic morning going through all this. Again, I want to echo uh, uh, Charlotte's uh, uh, thanks to David Stewart and uh, Heather, our, our speakers. And also I want to thank our young planners uh, who have been comparing the, the Q&A sessions today as well. So Alexa, Bethany, Susie and Graham on all of that. And of course, on behalf of East of England and the South East of England, I want to thank you Wei, for coming down and uh, uh, and taking this virtual tour and uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, subject to government lockdown restrictions easing hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, welcome you down here for uh, uh, for the latter half and actually have a, a proper presidential visit with you so thank you very much thank you much for thank you very much for having me thank you really enjoyed it very much <laughs>